two men. Two philosophies. Two choices. One decision. You decide. We hope you enjoy this particular debate. This will be debate number nine of our series. Against uh, This is me against Dr. Karen Bartelt. In the early 90s, I was on a radio program in Morton, Illinois, kind of a, a talk show type thing, and uh, Karen Bartelt called in and was saying how that creation was not true and evolution was true. And then later that week or some other, shortly thereafter, I did a debate against a, a preacher who had become an atheist, a Church of Christ preacher who gave up on Christianity. And that was a very fascinating debate, and Karen Bartelt was there. And she wrote in uh, quite a lengthy letter to the editor, which is currently on the website. If you look up Bartelt or Hovind, you'll find her letter on there, complaining about my poor visuals, visuals being of poor quality and things like that, and saying how that evolution is a fact. And so I was very happy when she agreed to debate me publicly. Uh, most of her debate, as we uh, did this one in Peoria, Illinois, at a Unitarian church, most of her... Uh, objections seemed to be personal. She was objecting to me personally, to my degree, to my credentials, uh, et cetera, et cetera, as opposed to dealing with the subject matter. But we think you really enjoy this one. This is going to be the only debate uh, that we've ever done that I'm going to stop from time to time and put in my comments, edit things in, into this debate. And uh, anyone uh, is certainly welcome to schedule. I'd be glad to come debate against any two or three or four professors at a time, as long as each side gets equal time. There is absolutely no evidence whatsoever for the general theory of evolution. It is a religion. It is something people choose to believe in, in spite of the lack of evidence. And I'd sure like to challenge you to rethink uh, what you believe. We hope you enjoy this one. Thank you. Many people have asked me why I decided to appear with Kent Hovind, and a few discouraged me from doing this. My reason for being here is solely that I believe Hovind is a proliferator of scientific illiteracy, and I want to do what I can to make the public aware of the fallacies of his arguments. Hovind might say that evolution is a religion. Well, he's entitled to his opinion, but it's clearly been stated in the 1994 Peloza decision that evolution defines a biological concept, and Peloza's complaint was rejected because the Supreme Court has held unequivocally that while belief in a divine creator of the universe is a religious belief, the scientific theory that higher forms of life have evolved from lower forms is not. So, you know, definition's fine, but the courts aren't buying it. Well, he might then go on about evolution being only a theory. I'm sure sick and tired of hearing that one. You're darn right it's a theory. And, um, here are some other things, natural phenomena, that are also only theories. The sphericity of the Earth, gravity, atomic theory, electric theory. They're all very good theories. Now, what is a theory? A good theory is a hypothesis which has been subjected to many tests. They are never proven absolutely true. They're based upon long-term observation and correlation. They're not believed, but accepted provisionally. They're strengthened as data from different disciplines are explained, and they make predictions that can be tested. And the ev evidence showing that evolution has occurred is stronger than that which shows that the planets go around the sun, because it comes from a wider variety of areas. What Dr. Bartelt is doing here is what's called bait and switch in advertising. She's giving one definition of evolution and saying it's just the theory of evolution is just like gravity and things like that. What they mean by that definition of evolution is microevolution, minor changes. But what they do is they sneak in, a lot, once people accept that definition, they sneak in all sorts of other things that have to do with macroevolution. So watch for the bait and switch tactic, which is, of course, illegal to do in advertising. You can't advertise a new Lincoln for $10,000, and when you show up to buy it, you find out it's a skateboard or a, or a Toyota. 
uh, that's illegal. And but the, by giving two different, right, by not giving the other real definition of evolution, they do this. She mentions uh, she's her purpose is to fight against my scientific illiteracy. That is precisely my purpose in life is to fight against the illiteracy scientifically in the theory of evolution. It is bankrupt. There is no evidence to support it at all. So watch for this. One of the frequently asked questions at Hoven's website is, how would you answer critics like Madsen, Babinski, and Bartelt who have written bad things about you? Bad things, Kent? Well, Dave Madsen has written this point-by-point -point refutation of Hoven's Young Earth arguments. This is available. Uh, you can download this from the web. Ed Babinski has written this uh, smaller pamphlet detailing some evangelical Christians who think that the earth is old. And this is available from Mr. Babinski. Karen, these comments that these uh, fellows have made, uh, Babinski and Madsen, I have read uh, very carefully, and I certainly appreciate anyone who criticizes my ministry. Critics can be your best friend. They can show you things that you're saying that are wrong, and I have definitely made some changes because of their comments. But uh, I w if there's any particular individual one you'd like me to comment on, I'd certainly be glad to on uh, the books that these guys have written about me. The answers that they give to my questions and the criticism they give is absolutely silly, and I felt was not even worth an answer. I'd certainly be glad to debate them or anybody else publicly, and I'd be glad to come debate uh, at any university or college that you know of. I think uh, anyone who reads their answers or reads their comments with an open mind, if they have any questions about it, please call me. I'll be glad to answer anything they have written. I just didn't feel like it was worth wasting time to answer that big book. Like Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah, he was asked to come down and stop his great work while they uh, discussed some things with him. His enemies asked him to do that. He said, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. So I haven't taken time to answer all their critics, but I certainly would be willing to if you'd like to call on the phone, but I will not respond in writing because it simply takes too long. Thank you. My loan contributions were a letter to the Peoria Journal Star in 1993 disputing some of Hoven's assertions and a few calls to the media after I found out that Hoven had misrepresented himself by saying he had scheduled a debate with Stephen J. Gould. Uh, Karen, the church that was having me speak in Boston did indeed contact Stephen Gould or told me that they had and told me that they had a debate scheduled for Stephen Gould. I did not re misrepresent myself. I honestly thought there was one coming to pass, and I'm still willing to debate Stephen J. Gould. Uh, so that was not a misrepresentation. Please don't say things like that. Why do we say these bad things? Because Hoven's website and seminar notebook are monuments to scientific illiteracy. They contain incorrect information, outdated information, and misrepresentations of scientific principles. All of them straw men. Hoven calls his mistakes gnats. And let's see what you think. The geologic column is a concept fundamental to geology and is one of those big pieces of evidence that supports biological evolution. These sedimentary layers are laid down such that the lowest layer is normally the oldest and contains the least complex life forms. As one goes to higher and higher layers, we see the emergence of more complex life forms. Accusations concerning the geologic column abound in Hovind's publications. He asserts that the geologic column does not exist in the world anywhere except in textbooks, and that it was made up by, by evolutionists to discredit the Bible. What is the reality? Well, first of all, a complete geologic column exists in North Dakota and at least 26 other... Time? Uh, a complete geologic column exists in North Dakota and at least 26 other basins of the world. Was it devised by evolutionists? No. It was devised by Christian creationist geologists like William Smith. William Smith was a creationist. He devised the geologic column in the early 1800s when Darwin was a baby. The geologic column was in wide use by 1830, almost 30 years before Darwin even wrote Origin of the Species. Now, most places do not have a complete geologic column. Illinois does not. And in some places there's been erosion. Some places there never was any rock in the first place. But as in this rock cut, sometimes the layers are folded. 
and sometimes they're even heaved up on younger strata, but none of these facts invalidates using the geologic column for determining the relative age of fossils. And anyone who has taken an introductory college course in geology knows this. Do evolutionists construct the geologic column? No, it's field geologists, often those in the petroleum industry, and they often know little of evolution and could care less. Here is a geologic map of Kansas constructed by oil geologists. Well, the geologic column has contributed to what we know about horse evolution, and here is what Hovind has to say. He says, they have taken critters from all over the world, South America, Europe, and Asia, and put them together in a predetermined area. They have already decided to start off with the smallest to largest animals. That is not the way they are found. So what Hovind is suggesting here is that scientists are being purposely deceitful. And if that's true, why don't you come up with a list of specific scientists and exactly what fossils you think are out of order? Your English teachers back at EP High would have a heyday correcting your vague allegations. He continues, they find them in different layers, but they have it in the textbooks that the Eohippus slowly changes into Equus, the modern horse. That's baloney. The only baloney here is what Hovind has written, so much that you might consider a hot link to the Oscar Meyer website. Hovind clearly doesn't understand that horses don't change into other horses, but that species branch. And here is a slide showing most of the fossil forms associated with horse evolution. Hovind again says, modern horses are found in layers lower than the Eohippus. Eohippus, Equus. If there is a particular Eocene Equus fossil, I challenge Hovind to submit his findings to a reputable scientific journal. And finally, he says, the Eohippus is nothing more than the hyrax running around South America today. Oh, really? The hyrax is not a horse at all. It's not even in the same order. And it doesn't live in South America. It lives in Asia Minor, in Ethiopia, and was known in the Bible as a coney. Does this look like a horse to you? Sometimes ancestral traits show up in modern forms, as one sees in this three-toed horse. Well, Owen has a lot to say about feathers, too. Hoven does not know the difference between the chemical that gives carrots their color and the chemical that makes feathers and scales. In this uh, excerpt from his website, he calls keratin, carotene. A real scientist would know the difference between the two of these, and yet he wants you to believe that he knows something about feathers. Well, what about feathers? Hoven claims that there are no intermediate forms between feathers and scales, that feathers are very complex, that they came from different genes, and that no missing links have ever been found. Feathers look complex, but they're actually very simple serial repeats. And an interesting experiment lately is that by using a mutant form of an enzyme, scientists were actually able to induce the growth of feathers on chicken feet where scales normally would be found. There is that not, not that much difference between scales and feathers. There is also a perfect intermediate, Longisquama, a fossil form bearing the intermediates between scales and feathers, and this fossil form has been around for 30 years. But Hovind doesn't really want scales and feathers to be different because he doesn't want to see any transitions between birds, dinosaurs, and reptiles. He wants immutable kinds. And here's what he has to say. First of all, regarding the lung, reptiles have a sac-type lung, and birds have a tubular-type lung. This is correct, and this betrays their ancestry. Birds have a lung core and air sacs that get into even bones. The bones get attacked by these air sacs and canals and holes are left. What other animals possess such features? Sauropod dinosaurs, theropod dinosaurs, and Archaeopteryx. Very good example of a transitional form. What about the heart? He says reptiles have a three-chambered heart and birds have a four-chambered heart. Well, wrong again. A crocodilian, alligators and crocodiles have four-chambered hearts. They are very different from that of a squamate, lizard and snake, and a turtle. This is exactly what one would expect if birds and crocodiles descended from a common ancestor. 
This is exactly what one would expect if birds and crocodiles descended from a common ancestor. Well, as you can see, all of these premises rely on feeding you an inaccurate picture of the science that really exists. So, why is the science so bad? Despite Hovind's claim of being a foremost authority, he has almost no science background at all. He claims to have a PhD from a place called Patriot University. Well, this is the uh, course listing from Patriot University, and interestingly, Patriot University does not offer a PhD. It does offer a doctorate of ministry in Christian education, where one would be taking Old Testament, New Testament, Christian education, and some electives. Patriot University offers almost no science courses at all, the Bible and science, creation and the collapse of evolution, medical science and the Bible, the biblical basis of modern science, and a health, nutrition, and first aid course, but that's about it. And in order to matriculate at Patriot University, one sends in love offerings. I can imagine what kind of grades you get if you send in love offerings every month, and I sure wish I'd been able to pay my tuition that way. Patriot University is located in a house in Alamosa, Colorado. It used to be located in a house in Colorado Springs, and there is no outward evidence that this house is Patriot University. A website run by Christians who evaluate Christian distance learning centers calls PU a diploma mill. So am I being elitist and snooty here? Well, no more than the rest of you. All of you have turned to professionals for medical or mechanical advice, and you assume a level of professional expertise. If you have a broken leg, do you want to get a doctor who graduated from U of I or one who learned medicine on his own? If you have a union card, did you get that by an apprenticeship or by workbooks and home study? Science is no different, and the practitioners of science also need to have a certain level of expertise, and this is most easily achieved by studying science at a university. Well, Hovind will now whine ad hominem or something like that. I'm not attacking him for his religious beliefs. It's the lousy science I'm after. Karen Bartelt here is uh, an, using an ad hominem argument, attacking me personally. Whether I have a degree or not is not the issue. Where my degree is from is not the issue. What am I saying is the issue. The, the university she teaches at is a small uh, college in Eureka, Illinois. I grew up not very far from that area. I'm very familiar with, the, with that region. And when President Reagan was there, it was a very, very small college, and yet their claim to fame is that it's the college of President Reagan. The size of the college doesn't matter. Darwin's degree was in theology, and yet I'm sure uh, Karen Bartelt and many others think of him as a, being a great scientist. So to attack the college is simply uh, not a valid argument. By the way, my degree is a Ph.D., Doctor of Philosophy in Education, and we'll show you a picture of that. I'm sick of these archaic arguments being trotted out as proofs of a young earth or evidence against evolution. And if an atheist like Richard Dawkins went off the deep end and started spouting this stuff, I would be happy to come up here and slug it out with him. So let the questions begin. I'm ready. Smoke weed every day.